One of the most important responsibilities for the federal government is the budget of the United States. My first budget will be submitted to the Congress next month. This budget will be a public safety and national security budget, very much based on those two, with plenty of other things, but very strong. And it will include a historic increase in defense spending to rebuild the depleted military of the United States of America at a time we most need it. And you'll be hearing about that tomorrow night in great detail. This is a landmark event, a message to the world in these dangerous times of American strength, security, and resolve. We must ensure that our courageous service men and women have the tools they need to deter war, and when called upon to fight in our name, only do one thing, win. We have to win. We have to start winning wars again. Advocate for the patients. Tom is all about the patients. That's what he wants. He wants to have a great health care system. Obamacare has been a disaster, and it's only getting worse. Last year alone, Obamacare premiums increased by double digits. Since it has gone into effect, premiums are up by almost 100 percent in many areas. And I think that this year, it's going to be really the year that I've always been predicted. 17 is going to be a catastrophic year for uh, Obamacare, for payments. And uh, you just take a look at what's happening in various states like Arizona. I believe it was up 116 percent. It's going to be worse this year. Obamacare forced providers to limit the plan options they offered to patients and caused them to drive prices way up. Now a third of United States counties are down to one insurer, and the insurers are fleeing. You people know that better than anybody. Since Obamacare went into effect, nearly half of the insurers are stopped and have stopped from participating in the Obamacare exchanges. It has gotten so bad that nearly 20 million Americans have chosen to pay the penalty or received an exemption rather than buy insurance. That's something that nobody's ever heard of or thought could happen, and they're actually doing that rather than being forced to buy insurance. We must work together to save Americans from Obamacare, and people know that, and everyone knows that at this point, to create more competition and to bring down the prices substantially. The chaos that Obamacare has created and for which congressional Democrats, and you see that, are alone and responsible for, requires swift action. I actually told the Republicans that if we did nothing, just do nothing for a two-year period, let Obamacare totally implode, which it's doing right now anyway, that would be, from a political standpoint, the best thing we could do. Just let it implode, and then people will come begging. The Democrats will come begging to do something to help them out of the jam. Once we start doing it, we sort of inherit the problem. We take over the problem. It becomes ours. But it's the right thing to do for the American people. I think allowing this to go on, this disaster to go on, is a mistake. So I'm asking Secretary Price to work with you to stabilize the insurance markets and to ensure a smooth transition to the new plan. And the new plan will be a great plan for the patients, for the people, and hopefully for the companies. It's going to be a very competitive plan. And Costs will come down, and I think the, the health care will go up very, very substantially. I think people are going to like it a lot. We've taken the best of everything we can take. It's our hope that Democrats will stop the obstruction and resistance, and that's what they have. In fact, they have a sign, resist, resist. They want to resist everything, including Cabinet members. They have many Cabinet members that haven't been uh, approved yet. People that are extraordinary, all of whom are going to be approved, but they just take forever. It's called obstruct and resist. I hope I didn't give them a new phrase, because their real phrase is resist. I think I just gave them another word. I, I shouldn't have done that. I'm good at branding. You're going, to see, you're going to see them now come out, obstruct and resist. All right. Well, at least I can take credit for it. And they work with us. And we are going to hopefully work with the Democrats, because ultimately, we're all people that love this country, and we want to do the right thing, including reforms like expanded health care savings accounts, state flexibility, and the ability to purchase across state lines. The state lines are so important for competition. Everybody's wanted to do it for years. What's not to do? So that's going to be very important. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to know, and I want you to know, 
that it's an honor to do business with you. It's a great honor to have you in the White House. And we look forward to providing health care that is extraordinary, better than any other country anywhere in the world. And we can do that. We have the talent, we have the capacity, and we have the people. So we'll work on that together. And maybe before the press leaves, we can just introduce yourself and your company, and the public will get to see what you're about. And then, if things aren't working out, I'm blaming you anyway. You know that. <laughs> so we'll start with Brad. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate the opportunity Thank to be you. here. I'm Brad Wilson, President and CEO of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, and pleased to represent our 3.9 million customers here today. That's great, Thank Brad. You. Great job. Mark Bertolini, Chairman and CEO of Aetna. Aetna. Matt Isles, uh, I represent America's health insurance plans. We represent all health insurance plans in Washington, D.C., including uh, plans that cover Medicaid managed care. Bruce Broussard, CEO of Humana. Pat Garrity, I'm the CEO of Florida Blue, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan in the state of Florida. Great. I'm Steve Hemsley, I'm from United Health Group. Oh, we're a diversified health care company. We have about 230,000 employees. We serve about 120 million Americans. And we are um, contributing in terms of the jobs. We've grown jobs 35,000 in the last five years, should grow 10,000 in the coming year. And we're a mission driven enterprise. Help people live healthier lives, make the system work for everyone. Much more Great. Thank you very much. President David Cordani from Cigna Corporation. We're a global health service company. Sure. Scott Sirota from Cross Blue Shield Association. We represent 108 million subscribers. 108 million, that's a pretty big group, right? Yes, it is. Pretty big. Good morning, Mr. President. I'm Joe Swedish with Anthem. Uh, we're in 14 states, representing 40% of the American public. Uh, we have 40 million members, and we've been involved in the individual's book for probably seven decades, and deeply embedded in the Affordable Care Act situation that has evolved over the last three years. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank you for the swift and decisive action that occurred most recently regarding some adjustments that have right. occurred in and around special enrollment, et So thank you very much. It was going change. to be an implosion. We had to step in. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm Bernard Tyson, Chairman and CEO of Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, better known as Kaiser Permanente. We cover 11.7 million Americans. We also are an integrated delivery system, so we both provide the coverage and the care. Uh, we have Permanente Medical Group that contract exclusively with Kaiser Foundation right. Health Plan, and we're proud to care for 11.7 million people. Thank you, Bernard. Mr. President, I'm Dan Helferty. I'm based in Philadelphia, Independence Blue Cross, Independence Health Group. We're in 32 states in the District of Columbia. Um, have a large Medicaid managed care population. We do, uh, we're the only player on the exchange in five county Philadelphia area. Uh, and again, I'd like to echo Joe's point. We're thrilled with the initial steps to stabilize the market. We look forward to working with you, Vice President Pence, uh, Secretary Price, and making sure that we have a sustainable program for years to come. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And the market, as you know, when we talk about stabilizing the market, the market is disastrous. It's going to absolutely implode. It's why we're meeting today. And I think we're going to come up with something where not only will the market be great, but the people are going to be taken care of. So we will work that out, I think, quite easily, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Mr. President, do you support a special prosecutor on Russia? Thank, Thank you. you. Let's go. Do you support a special prosecutor on Russia? Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank been a lot of fun, but we've accomplished almost everything we've started out to accomplish. What has the Trump administration done? They've done nothing. We're more than two hours into the show and Donald Trump hasn't tweeted at us once. I'm starting to get worried about him. Any information that's being leaked out of this administration needs to have a lid put on it. Pfizer called nearly two dozen staffers into his office and asked them to hand over their phones to prove they weren't the leakers. Kurt Bush wins the Daytona Bravo. What about that? It is a big week ahead for President Trump as he gets ready to make good on more of his campaign promises. And the Academy Award for Best Picture. <laughs> La La Land. There's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture.
Moonlight Wanted. This is not a joke. I'm afraid they read the wrong thing. Moonlight. Best picture. I don't know if Men at Work had that in mind when they wrote this song, but it's certainly appropriate today. It is fitting, right? Yeah. There they were. They starred as Bonnie and Clyde in the movies, Fade On Away, and uh, uh, Warren Beatty last night. The Oscars, as you said, how come I'm reading all of these, uh, what are presumed to be private conversations and private staff meetings with the communications department, why am I reading them in the newspaper with these in, in, uh, unflattering remarks about the West Wing. And so uh, he had everybody in the communications department apparently leave their phone on a table as they came in, and then he said, we're going to have the White House lawyer look through your phones and see who you've been talking to because I'm sick and tired of these leaks. Do you have a problem with that? Because I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I have no problem with... Because this is this is national secrets, either on my team or not on my team. Mm -hmm. And if I'm Sean Spicer, I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying, listen, I'm having this private meeting with 10 to 12 people, and it's in Politico the next day or the Washington Post right. and New York Times. I have to know who I can trust. And guess what? They leaked out the conversation about the leak. Sure. Right. And he said, this is the first time I'm doing this. I'm being nice here. If this happens again and you come back in my office, it's going to be a bad ending. Yeah, uh, and he also, I think he also gave up some of his stuff, Sean Spicer, he did. as part of this in front of the group, saying, I'm going to do it too, just to show you how important this is to all of us. He showed a couple of tweets. Uh, apparently he had a, a tweet called Confide, which encrypts things, and as soon as you text somebody then, it deletes. And he apparently deleted it right there. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, this particular communications department at the White House is comprised of a number of people from different campaigns, yeah. different campaigns that hated Donald Trump, but now they're working for Donald Trump. So are they out to make Donald Trump last night there at the uh, governor's uh, meeting, make him look good or make him look bad? With these leaks, a lot of the things look bad. So they got to crack down. Yeah. And of course, the president wants to crack down on them, too. Yeah. Corey Lewandowski had that same point uh, when he was on with, with Chris Wallace yesterday. Any information that's being leaked out of this administration needs to have a lid put on it, and it's very hard to do when you've got career bureaucrats sitting in these government agencies who have access to information that have a completely different agenda. And if the Senate would confirm the president's selections for secretary and then the, the under positions, we could stop those things. That's very important to do, so hopefully the Senate will take those up and confirm those. But it's not just the Senate. There are people that the Trump administration mm -hmm. could just be appointing and hiring. they got to pick up the pace. They did the nominees quick. The Senate held them down. It's a surprise and disappointing to every, should be, to every American because you can't function with half a staff. But the people that need to be appointed without confirmation, I'm talking about 500 oh, yeah, people. That's the problem. And they've got access to this information sure. that can be leaked. And they're there disgruntled some of them. Yeah, certainly, and it's not just a problem in the West Wing. Uh, I believe it was last week the State Department put out a four-page memo about how these leaks are against the law, and of course it was immediately leaked. Yeah. We're, not <laughs> leak we're not leaking this out. Uh, we're going to sit down with the President of the United States uh, late this afternoon in the East Room of the White House, and you will see the exclusive morning show first interview with the President of the United States, Donald Trump, tomorrow right here throughout the program. What, do, what do you guys want to ask him? We don't know. I we're know you've thought a lot about gonna this. It's going to wing it. <laughs> see how it goes. Whatever comes up, man. But send us your questions as well, because, I mean, I'm sure you guys already have a stack that have we been do. sent in from, a lot from of our house. Right She's sliding under our door. <laughs> We've gotten yeah. thousands from I'm you. I'm going to go directly to you. And on the, on the train right down to Washington, we're going to go through the entire list. So if you have a question, email us, or you can Facebook us or tweet us. In the meantime, 612 here in New York City on this Monday morning, Senator Elizabeth Warren has been vocal in her support of immigrants and refugees. It is illegal. It is illegal. It is unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional. It will be overturned. That's right, hold the bullhorn. But now some of our nation's heroes are asking, when will the senator have their back? Those veterans will join us live next. And many on the left around the world plotting another women's march against President Trump. And this time it's being organized by a convicted terrorist. Yep. Fantastic. A U.S. veterans group is criticizing Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and other lawmakers for their support of illegal immigrants, demanding that they instead put veterans first. In an open letter to all Americans, Veterans Assisting Veterans writes this, Senator Warren and others like her, they should know the difference between legal and illegal activity and should choose instead to act out negatively in selfish political 
theater. Where should rally for U.S. veterans, Senator Warren? So do they have a point? Let's bring in two of the veterans behind that letter. John McDonald is a spokesperson for veterans, assisting veterans, and the president of that group, Dennis Michelle. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you uh, for having us on once again. Thanks. Yeah, so we it. had you on yesterday morning. There was such an overwhelming amount of support. People were loving what you were saying yesterday. John, what did you hear back? I'm going to tell you what. I heard from veterans that I served with in Operation Desert Storm 20, over 25 years ago uh, and veterans across this country that had responded. And, um, you know, this is a real call to action. The one thing that they asked about is that, you know, how do we help? I, and I just want to say that, you know, each veteran listening, uh, that, you know, we took an oath to defend our country uh, against enemies foreign and domestic. And uh, none of us have been released from that oath. Um, we're asking our brothers and sisters, our fellow veterans, to join together once again and to rise up um, to take on a cause. And, 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 and that cause is a fight for each other. Yeah. Um, organize. Take action. Call your representatives. Uh, speak out against you know this 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 injustice, which is we've had politicians in this country that are openly talking about violating the law and supporting illegal immigrants, people that should that don't even belong here. You know we're not an anti-immigrant group. This isn't a political statement. Right. But we have a group of politicians that are literally shutting down the government, refusing to work with the president of the United States. Uh, it, it, veterans can't afford. Another four years of inaction at the VA. And Dennis, we just found that, find out it's absolutely outrageous. And Dennis, you know, this is really a wake-up call for Senator Elizabeth Warren. You say, we see you out there at the airport with your blowhorn protesting what's going on with immigration. Where is that same anger and frustration when it comes to our veterans? You think about even just the city of Boston, right? You've got City Hall where so much is happening with immigration. And then the homeless shelter for veterans right behind that city hall. What message do you have for Senator Warren, and why are you focusing so much on her? The message we have for every politician in this country <clears throat> is there are between 15 and 20 million veterans. If we get all our veterans together, the people that are serving currently in the armed forces, and call our representatives, we have an unbelievable voting block. I got a call from a Marine yesterday. Uh, he's in San Diego. One of his fellow Marines needs a colonoscopy. They told him to wait seven months for it. Why don't we give veterans the same health care that we give Congress, the same health care that Elizabeth Warren has in the rest of the Senate and the Congress? Let's give it to the veterans. Yeah, that's then so the awesome. argument is over. Thank you guys for being with us. Thank you for your service as well and for that message. I think it's one that we all need to hear, John and Dennis. Really appreciate that. Thank you, for the Thank, you for Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Democrats claim they're now a party united after electing a new chair to the DNC. But is that really true? As some liberals say, the race was rigged. The Woodhouse brothers, they are here to debate that next. Good morning. Welcome back to Fox and Friends. Some quick headlines to bring you right now. The man who is accused of plowing down dozens at the largest Mardi Gras parade had a blood alcohol level three times the legal limit. Police in New Orleans say Nielsen Rizzuto hit two cars and then he veered into that crowd. Nearly 30 people were hurt and the youngest was just a year old. The driver sharing this chilling post just hours before that tragedy saying, quote, when you have insane driving skills. He's now in jail facing several charges. 500 headstones toppled over in another disgusting act of vandalism as a Jewish cemetery in the United States. Right now, Philadelphia police are trying to figure out who did this and why. This comes less than a week after vandals overturned more than 100 headstones at a Jewish cemetery in St. Louis. You can see right there the vice president, Mike Pence, helping to clean up that damage. In the last month, more than 60 Jewish centers across the country have now received bomb threats. And tragedy striking Hollywood twice over the weekend. The actor Bill Paxton and a friend of our show here passing away suddenly from heart surgery complications, his career spanning nearly four decades. I think we're going in! Houston, we got a pretty large bang there associated with a master alarm. Bill Paxson was 61 years old. I have to say, I've spent some time with him in our green room here, and he was a lovely man, so polite. And we also lost one of the original reality TV stars, the judge Joseph Wapner, laid down the law in the People's Court back in the 1980s. Judge Wapner was 97 years old. And those are your headlines. There was that one movie, Wapner, Wapner. Was that from uh, Forrest Gump, maybe? 
Can oh, you sit Rain, down Man. That? Rain Man. That's right. That's right. There you what go. a loss. All right, Heather, thank you. Meanwhile, despite their crushing November loss, Democrats choosing another establishment candidate to be the DNC head. We will all be able to say the United Democratic Party led the resistance, ensured that this president was a one-term president, and elected Democrats across this country. President Obama's former Labor Secretary Tom Perez edging a, a narrow win over controversial congressman from Minnesota Keith Ellison. But is the party really united, as Mr. Perez claims? Here for a debate, the Brothers Woodhouse, we got the president of Americans United for Change, Brad Woodhouse, screen, as you can see right there, left, and his brother, executive director of the North Carolina Republican Party, Dallas Woodhouse. Guys, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Brad, let's start with you. Uh, your party, after this last election, is in a ditch. Is Mr. Perez the guy to drive you out of the ditch? Well, look, I've, I'm really happy with Tom Perez. I would have been happy with uh, with Keith, Keith Ellison. Uh, look, I.